I am delighted to introduce you to Roger Dooley, a best-selling author of Friction, one of the best in class books on anything related to customer experience, and a best-selling author of Brain Fluos, a book that defined how we use neuromarketing. Roger, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me on the show, Alex. Let's dive into your books. So obviously, there's a lot of applications of neuromarketing that are happening to us in our everyday lives. So it's good for us to know where we're being influenced as consumers. And those of us that in the audience that are you know really interested in creating world-class communications in moving their organizations forward, their audience forward, how can they use neuromarketing to succeed in the areas that you specialize in, which is customer and employee communications and experiences? Uh, maybe, Alex, we should start by defining what neuromarketing is. And I'm going to use my definition, which tends to be broader than some, at least uh, some historic definitions. Uh, I consider neuromarketing to be uh, any use of our understanding of how the brain works to improve your marketing efforts. And that can include neuroscience and the tools of neuroscience, which is the uh, foundation of early commercial neuromarketing, things like using EG or fMRI to measure brain waves, and some uh, sort of neuro-adjacent techniques like uh, eye tracking and biometrics. Mm -hmm. Again, and what, what the purpose of using these tools was to understand and is to understand what consumers really think, what they really want, because forever, marketers have tried to figure out what people want by asking them questions. Mm. What would you like in a product like this? Would you buy this particular product that we're showing you? Uh, and what we all know is that people can't often answer those questions. They can't answer them accurately. Uh, sometimes they may answer them even dishonestly, depending on the nature of the product. But usually it's just an inability to give a an answer that really reflects what's going on in their head and what their future behavior will be. Very hard for people to predict future behavior in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. But in any case, that's why people started looking at neuromarketing. And boy, it's been just a, just under 20 years since I started writing about that topic. What I found was, though, that in the early years of neuromarketing, this was mainly for big brands, the BMWs and Coca-Colas of the world, who wanted to see which version of a Super Bowl ad was most effective uh, with their customers. Uh, and that's fine for them, but for the vast majority of businesses, small and medium businesses, even uh, other large businesses, uh, this was not really a practical thing. And what I found was, my as I wrote about these topics, uh, mm -hmm. my audience was pulling me in the direction of more application of behavioral science, the principles of Robert Cialdini, the ideas yeah. of Daniel Kahneman, of B.J. Fogg, uh, which can be applied uh, at scale by any size business, even tiny businesses, they can use these tools more or less for free. And you can pick up a copy of uh, Bob Cialdini's book or my book, Brainfluence, and you can start doing these things without really any additional cost. It's usually just involves changing your messaging, changing your imagery, even things like changing fonts and colors. And I, wanna, Go ahead. I love that you're intersecting this because I think what happens in the academic disciplines is like, oh, I'm a neuroscientist. And you go into a little neuroscience bubble and then behavioral science, it's somewhere closer to the economics department. And sometimes they don't talk to each other. And it, But at the end of the day, as a practitioner, you need to take a combination of things that work. And so there's things. And so we literally had to, when we were designing Relate to, for example, I remember I hired a PhD in psychology and just had her go discipline by discipline go, okay, what's cognitive fluence? What's the re latest research in cognitive fluence? And then, okay, like how do we combine that with behavioral science? Because typically academics, they isolate one little element and just prove that element works. And that's not real world. In real world, you have a, a package of features and capabilities that you need to bundle together. So tell me more about this, like the mix where you're applying cross-discipline insights from economics, social psychology, and neuroscience. And is there an example where everything comes together in one beautiful kind of element where you can put different disciplines into one insight? I'm not really sure they work exactly in that way, at least not the way I'm thinking about it right Tell now, me. Alex. But I think that the 
we as consumers are constantly uh, bombarded by messages that are, that are based on behavioral science. Uh, when you visit a travel site and that there's only two rooms left at this price, uh, that's employing scarcity, one of Bob Cialdini's principles. When you see on that same site that 50 people are looking at this hotel right now, say, that's social proof. And it's all creating a sense of urgency for you that this is scarce, it's popular, uh, I better book now. Uh, and these, this is behavioral science 101. And of course, uh, everybody uses it. One million sold. Our newsletter has 23,000 subscribers. Uh, all of these things are uh, very simple uh, uses of behavioral science. Often now, some of these are so common that people don't even think of them as being rooted in science. It's just, oh, yeah, we should show that we're popular. Well, let's, and, so let's dive into uh, that example. So, for example, on that same website, the most important scarcity message needs to be easy to read. And maybe it's in red and bright red to highlight the contrast from other messages that are maybe more standard, right? And so that's a combination in, in my head of if I am designing an app or a website, this is how I'm combining scarcity, which is a behavioral science, with a neuroscience, which is my eyes and my fluence, cognitive fluency of processing information needs to go to that very visceral message that's going to hit my my crocodile brain. And so that combination, I think, is powerful, right? So you could have fantastic copy based on Cialdini, but if it's in like small print, somewhere barely visible, and that happens to be the most important message, it doesn't work, right? Like it doesn't, like it does, the, the attention doesn't get through it. That's what I mean by confluence of different... Right applications. Do you see right. folks? I, I, yeah, Alex, I agree with you completely on that. And often, I don't really do much consulting. I mainly speak and write these days. But when I've been called in sometimes to sprinkle some magical neuromarketing dust on somebody's website, often it's not that their slightly better messaging based on behavioral science is going to make it perform better. It's the basic sort of things that you're talking about where you know people can't find the buy button. So I think, yeah, combining a uh, technique like uh, eye tracking, for example, where you can see mm -hmm. what people are looking at in uh, the order that they're looking at, or they're looking at that first or second or third or fifth. Uh, that kind of information is very useful for uh, understanding your how your customers behave. Uh, things like click tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we're getting a little farther away from uh, neuroscience, but what click tracking measures the behavior of your customers or your visitors. And there's a lot of hidden information there. Uh, people often measure which links people click on. You mm -hmm. get a, a sort of heat map, you know, 10% uh, of the people clicked on this link at the top and 5% clicked it on this other link. What you don't see in those sorts of things is the stuff that people uh, are clicking on that doesn't do anything. They're mm -hmm. trying to click on that headline uh, and nothing's happening. And when you measure, when you do click tracking, uh, you see that. And that's telling you uh, some really interesting information. First of all, it's telling you if people are clicking on something that's not clickable, and quite a few people are doing it, then you either need to make that thing clickable or change the design so that people are... So it doesn't uh, look like it's clickable. want them to click on yeah, 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 right, yeah. is miserable. But also, I, I recall one story about a company that had five product benefits listed yeah. under in a paragraph, and they're just like five bullets. And when they looked at click, track, uh, click tracking map, what they found was that people are trying to click on these things and they weren't clickable. They were just bullet points talking about the product's benefits, but it, it told them a few things. First of all, maybe you should make those things clickable because people want to learn more about specific benefits. But also, Alex, two of them had more, much more, many more clicks than the others. And so that also told the company, these two benefits are what people are really most interested in learning about. So a huge amount of information from something that is often completely overlooked. If people click on something that's not clickable, who cares? Uh, there's information there and understanding your customer's real behavior. This is music to my ears and my other hat. To relate to, we one of the things that we do is we take a historically non-interactive content like a PDF or a PowerPoint that's meant to be consumed in a very linear fashion, and we make it interactive. And one of the things that we've noticed is once people realize that it's interactive, you're then, it's really important not to have like, for example, a rounded button that feels like it's a button that you can click on. 
but actually it's uh it's just a design thing in powerpoint that somebody has put together that's not clickable so either you need to make it clickable or change that design a little bit because once people think this is interactive their expectations are that they're going to click on the button certainly like the even before the bullets they'll try to click on the buttons and then what's interesting is we could capture not just oh do they click to page one or page two that we actually on the finally can capture what is it that they're doing and so that's and they're just mind-blowing for the average audience right you don't need to be a brain scientist you don't need to be neuroscientist this is just you can be an average producer of a sales presentation or a marketing asset and you just see like you said what people are looking at and uh one of the other things that i wanted to quote on and just say i totally support this and i'm curious your opinions you quote uh actually jeff bezos in your book friction and, and when you say when you reduce friction and make something easy people do more of it sounds very obvious and one of the applications of it that we see in content is if you make it very easy for somebody to navigate to the relevant parts of a let's say a book ebook or like 100 page book we actually see statistically that uh, if you make the navigation dynamic and easily exposable at any real time, people go much deeper into the content. They find the content that they care about that's relevant to them. They spend more time. Then they start wandering around because they fulfilled their need. Now they are now curious to learn more. And so it just creates all these positive ripples. If all you do is just, for example, reduce the friction of navigating through 100 pages with your thumb on a phone and like instead of either ask a question or just use a dynamic navigation to get there. Sounds basic, but I, I think it's a strong validation that when you reduce friction and make it easy for somebody to get to what they care about, they have positive association with that your service and they actually do on top of what they care about, they do a lot more. What have you been finding from from your workshop, the, the keynotes, in applying this notion of reducing friction to drive behavioral change? I think that many executives underestimate the power of reducing friction, or they think that their current user experience, customer experience, employee experience is already low friction or as low as it can be. Jeff Bezos and Amazon spent millions of dollars to defend their one-click ordering patent. And the only advantage that gave them was one little click compared to their competitors. One right. tiny click. It doesn't seem like that much, uh, but at the time uh, Steve Jobs and Apple were introducing their new music store, they paid Amazon a million bucks so they could have that one tiny little click advantage too. But when we see companies in the real world operating, my friend Peter Ramsey in the UK is a user experience expert. I, I recommend his stuff. He's at builtformars.com, mm. I believe. The He did an analysis of bank banking where he did he subjected himself to something totally inhumane he opened up accounts at 12 different banks and fintech firms and then at each one proceeded to carry out transactions like make a deposit do an international money transfer this sounds like torture it, to me always, uh, always but, in one week always in one week of opening the account no this was and he then he documented each step of the process how much effort it took how many clicks it took how long it took for an account to become operational how long much effort to do a transfer and so on. And the discrepancies or the differences that he found were amazing. To open an account, I think, and this was a few years ago that he did it, things have probably even gotten a little bit easier now, but the best one was a FinTech firm that you could set up an account with at 21 clicks or something like that, a pretty low number considering you're mm. going through, you know, setting up an account isn't the, the, the easiest thing. The competitor with the most clicks was a traditional bank, a big brand bank, where it took 120 clicks uh, to do it, wow. which is insane. And uh, how long for an account to be operational? Most of the fintechs and even some of the big banks were able to get accounts fully operational and usable within two to three days. But uh, again, there, there, was, there were some outliers there where the longest one, which might have been the one with the most clicks too, took 36 business days uh, to get the account operational. Who's going to wait that long? They're going to open an account someplace else. They don't have, they don't have a month and a half of uh, real time to wait uh, for the account to be working. Companies just don't realize 
how important that is. And that's why in many cases, fintechs have grown far more quickly than traditional banks have been able to add. And of course, they're taking business away from traditional banks because they understand how to make things easier for their customers, how to onboard people easily, how to make the website very user-friendly right. uh, and their app very user-friendly. And that's, that's probably the most stark divide where you've got people that are basically companies that are in the same business, more or less. Uh, but uh, boy, some are really good at it and some aren't. What's really interesting about this is that you actually don't want to be comparing yourself to direct competitors or certainly the established brands. And I'll quote you again from your book, Friction, saying that you're easy to do business with is one thing. Delivering on that premise is another. If you really want to make it easy for your customers, don't compare your process to your direct competitors. They may be even worse. Instead, compare yourself to companies like Amazon. Your customers shop there. And that's friction-free experience they expect from you too. So I, I didn't read this before we've been thinking about this, but we, in our world, we are looking at when we're consumerizing enterprise and business content, we're not looking at folks in that universe. We're looking at Netflix, right? We're looking at Amazon and we're seeing, okay, these people also have a lot of complex information, right? Like you can buy anything and, and a sister. On, on Amazon, right? Any like movies have so many categories on Netflix. How do you make that sort of easy to digest and kind of continue to reduce friction and just can, can seamlessly get people onto the next show, right? Without clicking anything. So you have this continuous flow. And so that really inspired us. So tell us a little bit about what do you see as the best companies you know, look like when they look for inspiration, it's Amazon, obviously, but where else can people find inspiration for radically increasing their performance relative to the industry that they're in? Two examples uh, that I often you know, use are Uber, who crushed the traditional taxi business by eliminating multiple friction points in the process. We, we never, before Uber, we didn't think about taxis as being high friction. They were taxis, that's the way things were. People yeah. didn't see all the friction in that experience from trying to flag a cab by the side of the road to trying to explain to a driver, maybe with a language barrier where you wanna go, to paying at the end with credit cards or foreign currencies, figuring out tips, uh, all that sort of stuff. Were, these are the huge uh, friction elements but we just didn't see them because we thought they were inevitable. They're just part of the process. We couldn't yeah. imagine another way. And then two tech bros came along who knew nothing about transportation. And they saw that friction and said, oh, we can make it easier. And they did. And after that, every time Uber entered a new city, they just crushed the existing taxi business. Uh, it's You have to look for it. <clears throat> and you can't take everything for assume thing, take things for granted. You've got to imagine there could be a different way. Uh, I think another example of a company that oh, really grew in the face of much bigger, much better finance competitors is Zoom, which uh, yeah. we're on we're on Zoom now, and people think of them as a pandemic phenomenon. Suddenly, we're all on Zoom calls, wearing Zoom shirts. Even before the pandemic, they were I growing you much more some. quickly. I promise you, I'm, I'm fully <laughs> close. <laughs> uh, no comment. We they were growing bigger, than, faster, and surpassing in actual volume. Com huge companies like Cisco and Microsoft, Google. And how did they do that? For the first, I don't know, probably six eight years of Zoom's existence, their company mission was make communications frictionless, and they made sure that they were just dead simple to use to get going on, to start a call, to join a call. All that, they figured out the easiest, simplest way to do it. And if you've ever fought with uh, WebEx or uh, some of the earlier Microsoft apps, it, it could be challenging to get going, to get set up, to get them configured with your system and so on. And so they were already growing much more quickly than these big brands. And then when the pandemic hit, even IT departments, who were always the sort of, we're a Microsoft shop or we're a Cisco shop, uh, suddenly they had to say, wow, We've got to onboard 500 users uh, by Wednesday. No way we can do that with WebEx or right. uh, Skype. Just put them on Zoom. We'll figure it out later. And uh, this was huge for Zoom, although I ha have to add parenthetically that they did change their mission to something far more encompassing, be every, uh, the ultimate communications platform or something like that. It was 
the and they lost that frictionless emphasis. And I am finding a lot more friction on Zoom today. When I went to join this call, yeah. uh, I got it pushed me to their web app and then told me that I had update. And this is like I was joining it about with one minute to go. And I see this progress bar creeping along. So like, why can't you let me update later? You don't have, I don't have to update this second, do I? But they don't, they, they don't see that in their customer experience now that people often are joining a call at the last minute. Maybe they're even late for the call and you can't force them to update. Most software will say update now or try later, but in their infinite wisdom, Zoom would not take no for an answer. So I ended up having to ditch their app completely and join via web browser, which they conveniently make very difficult to find. It's a little tiny link at the bottom that is very hard to find. So I think Zoom has lost their focus on frictionless, but uh, they're still a good example of how by being easier than their competitors, they just blew them away. So it's interesting that we are applying this to examples from the consumer world, right? Like effectively, and Zoom is obviously business, kind of prosumer business application. But you've mentioned that you're spending a lot of cycles right now on simplifying employee experience, right? And how to reduce friction. And uh, when you were talking about those banking sites, it reminded me of one of the use cases that we see quite a lot. And su it surprised us, probably shouldn't have. But it, it, I think it's very telling. Roughly a quarter of U.S. economy is spent on healthcare, and a lot of that is a kind of pressure is put on the employees in choosing their healthcare plan or even choosing different Medicare plans that are available. And that information is incredibly complex. And so, when what we see HR departments, insurance brokers, and benefit advisors that kind of help the HR departments, they're overwhelmed themselves in supporting all sorts of employee queries. They are presenting typically a relatively complex set of uh, options to people that are not very familiar with the terminology, uh, find it overwhelming. And so people go either down the path of like least friction selecting defaults or like they have to spend a lifetime figuring this stuff out, getting your partner to make the right healthcare decisions. And this is at a time when half Americans are like f fearing some sort of bankruptcy related to a healthcare event, which means that this is actually, there's quite a lot at stake. And yet, because the information is presented in such a complicated way, people are making suboptimal decisions about their healthcare. Companies are not gaining the value from the investments they make in paying for healthcare. And it just feels like a massive, massive like burn of resources that go absolutely nowhere. So I'm curious how, what else are you seeing in employee engagement and employee communications that's a little bit backward? Because this feels like about as far from Amazon as you could get, right? Like when I'm thinking of, of this particular experience and we're, we're obviously helping people in this and we see great opportunities to help, but I think the status quo is really just a disaster. Are you seeing mm -hmm. like similar disparity between marketing grade in consumer, marketing in B2B, marketing in employee to, to employees? And any observations there would be really helpful. I, I think you've hit on two huge pain points, Alex. One is employee experience and its importance. And the other is the healthcare experience, uh, both for uh, patients, patient experience, and uh, the workers in that industry as well. But getting back to basic uh, employee experience first, uh, I've had uh, management guru Tom Peters on the Brainfluence show a few times, and uh, he emphasizes that your employees can never be, your customers, sorry, your customers can never be happier than your employees. I think he's mm. quoting John DeJulius there, but this is fundamental to much of his work these days, which is on an overall ethical company experience for customers, for employees, and just being doing right by all of your stakeholders. But uh, I think the point uh, that quote makes is that if you have unhappy, disengaged people, Mm. Uh, they are likely not going to deliver the exceptional customer experience that you're hoping for. And I think it's often overlooked because I think uh, Amazon is an example. They there has probably never been uh, as relentlessly customer focused a company as Amazon. They optimize every 
part of their customer experience, even returns to make it easier for customers, which having been in the mail order business for years, returns are not something you usually want to encourage. You prefer to discourage them because they cost you way more than you would think by the time you deal with the merchandise and process it and ship new. Mm -hmm. Oh man, they're terrible things for anybody in the direct marketing business, but Amazon makes them easy. But when it came to employee experience, we've heard some kind of right. nightmarish stories about Amazon employee experience where <laughs> people don't have time to take bathroom breaks. They're wearing diapers and such. And now those are probably extreme examples and maybe individual locations where management, uh, on-site management is less than perfect. But nevertheless, I think that Amazon for its early years largely overlooked employee experience, uh, particularly for its hourly workers. The You can look at other industries too, where they've got call centers and these uh, call centers are relentlessly optimized for efficiency. How many calls did you take? Gee, your average call length is uh, 30 seconds over our target. Uh, you need to tighten things up. You, know, you need to uh, get the customers off the phone more quickly. And so you're doing a few things there. First of all, you're demotivating your employees who want maybe to interact with the customers, but are feel like they're under pressure to uh, do things more quickly than they should or to implement policies uh, that aren't great for the customers. Uh, and when they have that feeling, they're not going to communicate with empathy. They're not going to seem friendly yeah. and happy to their customers. They're going to seem like they're you know, doing their job uh, and looking forward to uh, quitting time. In doing everything you can in, for employee experience, not only uh, will it increase your retention rate, increase your engagement rate, uh, make it easier to recruit new people. Uh, it has all these benefits. It'll make your people more efficient because often the things that are most demotivating to your own employees are things that waste their time. Processes they have to go through, forms they have to fill out that really aren't necessary. And usually they know when they're not necessary, but uh, that's the way we do it. That's how it's got to be done. And well, when I, you start el eliminating those, waste, those yeah. time wasters, uh, you were yeah. making them happier and getting more productivity at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I even wrote down another quote from your from the Brainfluence, and this one talks a little bit about the subconscious nature that people feel the attitude of your employees. And I'll quote it: "The passion of your the the passion your customers can sense, uh, the the passion of your people, even if they don't process it consciously." So they can process body language, speech patterns, and other cues to give your customers confidence that the person they're dealing with truly believes in your product. And I, I think this is really profound, right? So there's these all these cues and obviously people, some other communication messages that come from people, the enthusiasm, right? Like the person, does the sales rep feel like they have an extra quiver in their arrow and that gives them confidence and passion because they're well supported well then they will may have to be they may feel more confident they may they need to be a salesy they may actually relax and listen to the customer and so that creates all sorts of positive effects right or if the if there are resources that customers can then go find themselves for example like you you also wrote in the book that if people if you give stuff without asking for something in return, people appreciate that much more and then give stuff. So imagine you give people a great product tour of their of the demo of the product before asking them for their email, organization size, all these things to put them in some sort of a spam list. You give them something first of value. You And then that, that they are more educated and that opens up for a more genuine interaction between them and your employees feel happier. So I think there's a lot of really interesting intersections there that you brought up about enabled employees, selecting for employees that have the energy around customer, customer engaging, like creates spiral of positive benefits for the company down the road. Yeah, I think the passionate employee is really the most effective one, whether, whether they're in contact with the customer or not, but especially if they're in contact with the customer, because customers can sense when yeah. the employee, the salesperson is truly excited about the product, 
versus excited to make a sale and is listing the benefits to the customer. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a difference and people can be passionate about anything. You think, well, okay, so maybe I'm selling industrial chemicals. That doesn't sound like anybody's passion. But I think that even there, when you know that you can deliver something that's going to do the job for the customer, that you can deliver it on time, it's going to be better than the competition, and you can convey that excitement, you're going to be a lot more convincing. So let's so getting back to this the theme of like employees. So one is great employee experience selecting creates fantastic customer experience. What else do you see uh, that organizations miss when it comes to their how they treat their employees relative to maybe some other communication and experience goals? Right? Where can we tap other disciplines and bring that into employee experience? I think the biggest one, one there, I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for, but simply asking people what, I, actually, I recommend two questions. One is, what do our customers complain about? When you ask your, pretty, your customer facing people that question, or even the people that know about what customers are experiencing, what do our customers complain about? They have probably told you what customers complain about, but you didn't fix it. You know, was saying, well, yeah, but that would be expensive to fix, or that's in the roadmap for two years from now, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that when you ask employees that question, you're actually accomplishing two things. First of all, you are finding out what customers are complaining about, and uh, hopefully, maybe finding something you can take action on. And also, you are listening to your people. I think a huge complaint of employees is that nobody listens to me. I've told them that five times, and nothing happens. I'm, I gave up. When you ask people uh, with intention what customers complain about, and then you act on that, you listen, you act, then your people will really get on board and they will help you find more things that you can do for the customers. They'll say, hey, they fixed that one customer complaint. This other one isn't as important, but it's still there. And uh, let's talk about that one. The second question, Alex, is, and this one's kind of counter counterintuitive for managers, it is, how can we make your job easier? Now, usually you think of managers as thinking, how can you be more productive? What can we do to get more work out of you? Maybe not in those exact words, but that's how the questions are often what they're intended to elicit. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you ask people, how can we make your job easier? They will tell you where their time is being wasted by stupid mm. rules they have to follow that really don't matter, by processes that are inefficient. And everybody knows they're inefficient, but uh, nobody can change them, it seems. And that's an extremely powerful question because when, you know, as I mentioned a minute ago, when you eliminate a bad process, when you eliminate a rule that's wasting time that wasn't important to begin with, then you are making that employee happier, feel heard. You're also making them more productive. Right. So it's a complete win, but so many uh, companies simply fail to ask simple questions like that, or they may ask something along those lines, but then, oh yeah, we'd like to work on that, but boy, that's too expensive. That's legacy code. We can't change that. That's the way it is. The way it's got to be. And, and that in turn is demotivating for your employees. Got it. This is fascinating. I, I particularly, I, I love the idea of asking people something that you may already know, because Typically, it's a, in any organization, you, you have a, a large number of problems, right? And I think sometimes the problem with maybe a problem today may change in a week's time, right? And it's no longer a problem, right? And so it doesn't need to be appear. But if you, I think sometimes some very technical scientific people think, I already know that this is a problem. Don't need to be repeating it to me. I think it's quite the opposite. I think if you keep, if you ask this question, hey, where are customers having problems? And week after week, from different person to different person, you hear a similar pattern of issues, right? Then it allows you to say, hey, this is a highly rated problem. We got to address it, right? This is the blocker, right? Versus, yeah, okay, you ask it once. I know it's a problem. And then it somehow goes away until you hear the next new problem, right? Because we are novelty-seeking animals. So sometimes we tend to get excited about solving either something that's urgent or something that's new. And I, I feel like by having these fundamentally great questions, you, and in, even in, for, in, I think we noticed that you need to encourage people. It's okay to say, 
the same thing if this has happened before. You're not looking stupid. You're actually helping us because you're consolidating the data that, hey, this is a bigger problem than we even thought. So I, I think this is a very, I couldn't agree more. And I, as a builder of a product where you never have time to address every problem, you need to find ways to consolidate this feedback. And I think unlocking the frequency of that is, is quite valuable as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something else I've been thinking a lot about uh, mm. lately is trust mm. uh, inside companies, customer trust uh, of companies as well, but especially inside uh, company. This is trust is a friction reducer. Often the reason you've got these bad processes in place is because of a lack of trust. I remember I've been an entrepreneur for decades, but I had a corporate stint for a few years where a company that I had co-founded got acquired. And I ended up joining that company in a senior role for a period of years. And despite the fact that I was theoretically a senior executive, I could fly business class internationally if I wanted to, if I filled out an expense report, I had to attach every single little piece of paper to get reimbursed. If I bought a $2 something or other, a cup of coffee in the airport, probably be a little bit more expensive these days, I had to have that piece of paper. And so when I would submit an expense report, it would have you know, these like wads of little receipts stapled to it where that was not a tax requirement. The tax would tax people, the IRS would let you use much higher threshold for actually documenting your expenses. As long as things were in reasonable, there's no need to document them. In this company you did, ultimately they streamlined the process by mm -hmm. going to a system where the person, the employee submitting the report could put their receipts on a flatbed scanner, scan them, and then number them and refer to those numbers in the expense report, which was not actually uh, an experience at hand, sir. It was uh, probably easier to staple uh, darn things uh, to the back of the paper than scanning them and numbering them. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it, sp it sped things up for the people in the office so who were looking at these things. And I found that people actually did review them. One time somewhere, I lost a receipt between when I filled out the report and <laughs> when I submitted it for like, it was just a couple dollars and they ended up bouncing it back saying, hey, uh, can't find this, uh, either correct the report or submit the receipt. And so really, we're doing this over two bucks. But I asked later on, I, after I left uh, the company and after the guy who was the CFO was also departed, I asked him, hey, why did you do this? It wasn't a requirement. He mm -hmm. said, there was a feeling that we could not trust the people to do it correctly or perhaps honestly, that if we did not have that requirement, people would be cheating. And so this lack of trust forced everybody in the company to go through this onerous process that wasn't really necessary. And I contrast that with uh, Reed uh, Hastings at Netflix's No Rules book, where basically they said, don't, don't worry about it, just to, you know, uh, we, don't have, we don't have a travel policy. We don't have an employee handbook. Do what's right for the company and mm -hmm. uh, uh, leave it at that. If you do something that ends up not being right for the company, we'll probably tell you once uh, and say, hey, this was not a good judgment. Uh, if you do it you know, a couple of times, three times, then we might uh, be <laughs> saying goodbye. But uh, you know, uh, they dispensed with all these administrative uh, things that were wasting people's time and also showed people there's a lack of trust. There's a lot of research on trust in companies. And one, one book I really is Trust Factor by Paul Zak. He's the oxytocin guy, discovered oxytocin mm -hmm. is the hormone of human trust. Mm -hmm. He and his team went into companies, uh, high and low performing, and did lots of surveys, thousands of surveys, asking people about different things in the company, including trust. Do you trust the company? Does your boss trust you? And so on. And then also taking thousands of blood samples. Oh, wow. And what they found when they got back to the lab, they analyzed all this data, uh, was pretty amazing. Uh, the high performance companies were high trust companies. Not only in the high performing companies, did the survey show that there was higher, there were higher levels of trust, but the levels of oxytocin in people's bloodstreams were higher in those companies. To me, this is a great example of how using, whether you want to call that a neuromarketing technique or a biometric technique or something, it shows, it confirms sort of the soft information that you're getting too. And you know, that's, uh, that was really brilliant research. And I think there's a lesson there for companies. And it, certainly we've all been part of companies where there has been, not been a lot of trust, whether it was between coworkers or between the company and the workers where everything seems just a little bit adversarial. You need a stapler. Okay, fill out that form in triplicate and the VP will approve it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, stuff that just doesn't make sense. 
Yeah, this is fascinating. I think it's particularly relevant in the social context that we live in today, where there's a lot of mistrust, even in the social and national levels, cross national levels. And so any way you could build institutions. So I think that that build trust is important. I think this is a role for all of us as leaders to have that view, because I think, you know, if we can have oxytocin generating societies, I think lots of goodness all around. Building on that notion of trust, how do you build, let's circle back to BrainFluence maybe and to the customers and future customers that don't know you. One of the things that we spend a lot of cycles on is like, how do you, how do you build trust without boring people to tears? And a lot of scientific, kind of we talked about benefits and like a lot of technical complex topics, there is a desire to share all the information to show that there has been work that's been done. But our attention spans are shrinking. We're like a gold, now goldfish on, on the an adrenaline or something like that, right? Like not even a goldfish anymore. And so we're jumping around. We may not have as much patience, at least at the very beginning, to go towards deeper detail that sometimes builds trust. Do you have any ideas on what you can do in that context where there is an information heavy environment, but you, you you can't overwhelm people with too much detail in order to build trust? I think if you're building trust, you have to start with just a few simple uh, uh, things. Uh, one is to be trustworthy yourself. Yeah, uh, that's That goes a long way. Nobody is going to trust a person who does not behave in a trustworthy manner themselves. Uh, you know, it's, it just uh, doesn't make uh, sense. And also, uh, the flip side of that is to be trusting. Uh, when you trust somebody, whether it's a, a subordinate, a coworker, a, a boss, mm-hmm. you show that you're trusting them, yeah. uh, they're more likely to trust you. This is goes back in part to Cialdini's principle of uh, reciprocity, reciprocation, where when you do something for somebody else, they're more likely to uh, do something for you. And in this case, trust is reciprocal. Being trustworthy and extending trust yourself, trusting people, are probably the two simplest things you can begin with. I think in a, a company environment, transparency mm. is another one. If uh, people see things as uh, opaque, then they're going to be less trusting. Mm. I had a, a friend who was working for a company who, out of the blue, got called into her boss's office and got laid off. And there mm. was no no lead up to that. Mm. And I, I believe it was more of a business issue than a performance issue, but it doesn't matter. If, if you had no idea that there was a problem in the business and then suddenly you've got your severance package in hand, that's not a trusting environment. There was not that communication leading up to that point. In -hmm. fact, if the company was having issues, the way you solve those issues is by being totally transparent with your people about what those issues are and what they can do, what they need to do to make it better. Here's where revenue has to be. Here's where costs have to be. Here's where this other metric has to be for us to be successful. But often managers hoard that information as if, oh, people understand that they're going to be demoralized, they're going to be scared, but that's not how it works. When you're upfront with people, they will work to make things better for sure. I think those three things. And another, if you look at it from a customer trust standpoint, yeah. Alex, yeah. Amazon is probably the most trusted retail brand, maybe the, the most trusted brand. They didn't get to that position by saying, hey, trust us. They got yeah. to that by behaving in a very trustworthy manner, never hassling you about a return, never saying, point in the fine print. I've seen companies that are major companies that where the customer has a problem and the company dredges out something in the fine print that says, yeah, actually, see, we can do that to you. Yeah. It says so right here. And yeah, but that's not making the customer's situation any better. It's not making them feel any better. The fact that, okay, yeah. yes, you legally had the right to do that. Amazon doesn't behave that way. Even things like when you return something, I remember I now I usually do it at the Whole Foods where they actually, they can look at the product, but even if they don't, you just put it in the box and they trust you. And within uh, an hour, they say, okay, we see you return this item. Here's your refund. Oh. I could be shipping back a brick to them or something, yeah. but they trust me. And that makes me trust them. Yeah, this is really powerful. A C- couple of metaphors there that I'm taking away. One in particular, actually, that that was you were talking about predictability and kind of meeting the expectations of setting the right expectations is meeting them. In the user experience, there's a term called affordance. And that's when you're 
whatever whatever you're clicking around, it, you you can guess that if I click on this button, something is going to happen. And so that you then you meets your expectation. So we were talking about that a little bit earlier. And I think you're effectively saying this is this is true for internal communications. This is a little bit of a, a true for external. Like one of the things that breaks trust for me, for example, I notice sometimes people ask you, oh, it's just as easy as put in your email to get a gated asset. And then you put in your email and then a form opens up that's like the size of Tolstoy novel, right? Like the, that it has a right. bunch of things you need to fill out. And you're like, Okay, so I hear you're using Cialdini to get me started and get a foot in the door and get me to fill an email and kind of feel like you're you made a small commitment and you're I need to fill out this form. But subconsciously, I'm like feeling resistant uh, because you just cheated me. Like you said, it's going to be a small thing and then you misrepresented it. And marketers go, oh, look at how awesome we are. We are getting more leads filled out. But probably it's backfiring and they would have been better off just to keep that email and maybe the name and just not get that much richer form or find other ways to do that. And so I see these behaviors that are incongruent with the goals of building trust and go towards very transactional goals of, oh, I want to get a lead and, and say that I've contributed a lot to my pipeline, which is pseudo contribution because you've just betrayed trust before at the very first step of getting to know someone you're already like making things up so i feel like there's not enough of that mindset of trust building whether it's through the buttons that do what you expect them to do or or misrepresenting things to to meet some sort of corporate goals does that mm -hmm. you, you see these sort of counterproductive oh, yeah I, I agree that's a that, that, I love your example, Alex, of the uh, form that, oh, this looks simple. And then suddenly, whammo, there's this giant form to actually get the thing that they said they were going to give you. Uh, you're right. Maybe they do get more leads that way. But I doubt it. Abandon, the by the way, I, about the brand or, or a lot of people abandon it at that point. Abandon, anyway. Abandon rate already. is through the roof. Like, I think the abandon rate right. backfires. It. I just think people think they're clever. And I think they're just like, it's basically, it's... It, it almost feels if people understood Cialdini and where it interpreted the, like what we were saying at the very beginning, people take one thing, which is commitment and consistency, but then they break down trust in the process. And so you can't just look at one variable in optimizing behaviors. You have to look holistically. And I somehow feel like a lot of our optimization tools don't take that holistic view. And maybe it takes leaders that do that or a culture that kind of helps people refocus. Hey, are we in the business of getting pseudo leads or are we in the business of creating a memorable experience for visitors to come to us and assume that if we create a great experience, they will be champions in one way or another? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if people look at their analytics they can see if what you describe is happening. If they find, hey, people are willing to give me their email address and their name, but like 80% bailed out when I wanted to know the name of their company and their role in the company and other things, then that's telling you something about your customers. And you've got to make a decision as to, is there another way of getting this information? Is there an easier way? Can I eliminate half those questions and maybe reduce the abandon rate? Can I use a micro-commitment strategy by not giving them that giant second form, but by asking them a couple more questions at a time within reason before they get really frustrated and bail out. The, so there's a lot of things you can do. And obviously there's some free tools out there. Google Analytics can tell yeah. you a lot of that stuff and it's a free tool. Of course, you're sharing your data. There's another product that is much less known, but it's Microsoft's Clarity that mm -hmm. is a behavior measurement tool, as they call it. And it does things like click tracking and it does, you can use tools like that to really see what's going on with your customers. It takes a little bit of a time commitment. And of course, these are free tools, which means you're, you're paying with sharing your data to these yeah. two giant tech companies. But for many companies, that's an acceptable trade-off. You, you can have my data because I like the tool. And when you look at what your customers are actually doing, as opposed to what people think they're doing, you can really be surprised. Yeah. I think, and this leads to like starting at the, the very beginning back to how, how do you grab attention, right? Before, before you build trust, they need to know that you exist. 
And I want to come back to one of uh, your other quotes from Brainfluence, where uh, you talk about movement. And you say something like this, whether you're presenting to a group, selling on one to one-on-one, or designing a TV commercial, use motion to grab the attention of your audience and focus it where you want it. If there's one thing that's moving, that's where the audience will look. So back to what applying the lessons from TV commercials and maybe like world of one-on-one selling to maybe less exciting things like benefits, education, the things that are a little bit more one-to-many and internal. Uh, Like it sounds obvious, but if you give somebody static, non-moving asset that has every page looks the same, right? You, by definition, have a harder time drawing their attention to something that's important. Or if the motion is there to create a feeling of a feeling of, hey, we care about this. We thought about this, some trust, something on brand, aligned with the brand, employee brand proposition, whatnot. You can't do that because you have basically one sense, which is like black and white print consumption straight to your analytical brain. And so you're missing out all these other senses. So I see a lot of scientific, a lot of kind of employee communications is still organized that way, not using these basic things that are pretty obvious to folks in the advertising world or in sophisticated marketing and sales organizations. How do you feel we can get more people to become aware of this sort of how they're mismanaging the way they communicate? Is this something that's just been persistent in your view and people just think, about putting stuff on paper and not thinking about the audience, or do you see progress towards more visual, more movement since you've written the book? I think that we are a little bit less reliant on print, which by definition is a static medium these days. In other words, instead of just glossy magazine ads, now you've got web ads of various kinds that you can employ motion. You can do full video, you can animate things, you can do other stuff. One uh, little overlooked thing I think is where you can use motion to uh, either show effort or uh, create uh, delight uh, where, uh, you know, when I was trying to uh, log in here, I got hit by that zoom progress bar, which is basically a horizontal line, which was uh, moving rather, there was a colored part on the left that was moving rather slowly toward the right, towards the end goal, uh, which I, as I said, I bailed out of, but that's what most progress bars are. Sometimes you don't even have that. At least if a person sees like they're while they're waiting for your website, your app or whatever to do something, if they see a progress bar, they know something's happening. But uh, I think of a Lufthansa Airlines that has always had, when they're finding your flights or calling up your reservation, their progress bar has these like little airplanes uh, taking off on it, uh, which is, is really cool and fun. And it makes it slightly less onerous to sit there and wait for it. There are other ways Uh, of doing where, for instance, when a voice system is looking up your account, it may make typing sounds as if somebody's working on this. Mm. Uh, And that kind of implies that, or, and it can be visual too, of course, Uh, you'll see something happening where you see an elf on typewriter say, our elves are finding your account now, whatever. This shows that work is taking place and it makes people feel the experience itself is more valuable, not to mention a little bit more entertaining than just watching a blank screen and looking to make sure your browser isn't frozen or your app isn't frozen. So there, there's a lot of things we can do that I think are very simple and, and they're actually fun for customers too, because something, when you look at brand personality, mm. um, the you don't think of Germans as the uh, capital of fun on the planet, but the fact that Lufthansa, their, their biggest airline, uh, uses this little animation, to me, that, that sort of softens their image a little bit. I, I think the word that um, one of the uh, kind of experts in this field that I, I studied under when I was at Stanford, Jennifer Aker, she brought up this notion of uh, we, we need the, the things that bring up a sense of awe. So sometimes a mesmerizing image of airplanes lifting off or some clouds in the background, they are that's the sort of sense of awe. It doesn't seem like it should have a disproportionate impact, but it's these little things in the background that either saying, hey, you're not stuck, there's some, there's something going on, there's work being done, or just keep you busy. Just we the old technique of instead of replacing a faster elevator, just put a mirror in the lobby so people could get to 
look at themselves and so they get distracted and looking at something beautiful obviously the then it you creates this sort of positive experience around the experience and i'm glad to hear that there's a lot of quick fixes we're seeing this certainly around content just adding a background background video was like the just at the very beginning it sets the tone it could be effective if something is, takes a while to load we talked about netflix right they preload these little snippets so something is available right away when you're seeing a preview so these are all quick wins out there roger tons of ideas here super excited to get into the science the direct applications for employee and customer experience where can our audience find you and learn more the, from your experience? The best place to start, Alex, would be rogerdooley.com. There I've got links to my Forbes page, my YouTube channel, my socials like LinkedIn. I'm probably most active on LinkedIn, X, and now Threads, which I find to be a friendlier place than X and but I would start at rogerdooley.com. Also to my books, of course, there. But and if you can find me pretty much anywhere by Googling Roger Dooley. Roger, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your background. Thank you for writing great books and excited to have shared your experience with our audience. Thank you for having me on, Alex. It's been a lot of fun.